Hi everyone, welcome back. This next set of videos covers chapter three from our OpenStax textbook, and the topic is biological macromolecules. We're gonna be looking at carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So instead of jumping straight into chapter three, one of the first things I wanted to do was go over the functional groups we saw at the end of the previous video, the end of chapter two. I want to go over these in a little bit more detail because we will see them in the macromolecules in chapter three. So looking at all of these functional groups, all of them except for the methyl group are reactive. They will react with other compounds. And all of these, except for the sulfhydryl group and the methyl group again, these two, are hydrophilic. So all of the others are hydrophilic or water-loving. Remember that from chapter two? Water-loving, except for the two I put X's on. All right, now let's go over each of these in more detail. So the first one we saw last time was the hydroxyl group. These are polar because of the electronegative oxygen we saw in chapter two. So these tend to form hydrogen bonds with water. When you see the slightly positive hydrogen atom over here, hydrogen bond with another water molecule. A lot of the times we'll see hydroxyl groups in compounds that are alcohols. All right, so let me write that down, alcohols. So we'll see these in alcohols. Oh, that looks like a horrible A, that one's better. All right, our second one, methyl, methyl groups. Methyl groups, I said earlier, are not reactive and also not hydrophilic. These actually, we'll see in the future, affect gene expression. They can affect if a gene is on or off. They can also affect the shape and function of some of our sex hormones, like estrogen. So whenever you see these, these again, these are nonpolar, hydrophobic, and we'll see these in compounds that we call methylated compounds. All right, what is our next one? Our next one are carbonyl, carbonyl groups. I see one right here. These are again polar, water loving. If we see carbonyls with two carbons on either side of that central carbon, these are called ketosis, ketoses, keto, ketoses. And then if one of these is instead a hydrogen atom, which we'll see later on for the carbohydrates, we call them aldo, aldoses or aldoses. All right, let's continue on. I wanted to start with a new slide so it looks more clean. Our next one are the carboxyl functional group, and these can act as acids because they can release protons into solution. So a lot of the times when you see a carboxyl group in something, it could be called carboxylic acid or some kind of organic acid. Our amino groups are the opposite. They can act as bases because they can accept protons and that would form an H3+. We call these amines. We have phosphate groups that can usually contribute an overall negative charge when they release protons into a solution. And we'll see these in a compound called ATP later on. Whenever you see phosphate groups in our macromolecules, we usually call them organic phosphates. And then we have our sulfhydryl groups Usually what you're going to see is ultimately one molecule with a sulfhydryl group will form a crosslink with another, ultimately forming a covalent bond between the two sulfurs. Compounds that contain this are called thiols. In chapter three, we're going to be looking at four types of biological macromolecules that comprise the most of the cells dry mass. So remember that water makes up most of the cells mass, but these uh, macromolecules make up most of the cells dry mass. So the four types of macromolecules are carbohydrates, 
lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, and we'll be going over them in this order. All of these are organic macro, excuse me, organic molecules because they all contain carbon, and you'll also see they have the other elements important to life as well. Remember Chan from a previous chapter? We have all of these contain carbon. You'll also see hydrogen, oxygen, and in some of them, nitrogen, as well as other minor elements. So macromolecules are large molecules, but where do they come from? So we need to build macromolecules, and the building blocks are individual subunits that we call monomers. When you link a bunch of monomers together, and this is through the formation of a strong type of bond, the covalent bond, you get polymers. So a lot of the times I think of Legos, or these remind me of Legos, where the individual Lego pieces are the monomers, and the larger structure I get is the polymer. To form polymers, we go through a type of reaction called dehydration synthesis. So here I see dehydration synthesis in this reaction. I'm taking two monomers and I'm going to put them together, forming a covalent bond. And I get water as one of the products of the reaction as well. So water comes out of the reaction. And this is also sometimes called a condensation reaction. Notice that, again, this is a covalent bond and water comes out of the reaction for dehydration synthesis or condensation. The reverse can happen as well. So the reverse of dehydration synthesis is hydrolysis. You're adding water into the reaction to break the polymer into its subunits, the monomers. So this time water is actually a reactant instead of a product. You add water in and you take something that's bigger, like a polymer, in this case it's really a dimer, and you break it up into its subunits. So in this reaction, this is actually, we're starting with something called a disaccharide, two sugars, and the sugar that is shown here happens to be something called maltose, and we're breaking it down into two monomers, which happen to be two glucose molecules. So this is actually the opposite of dehydration synthesis, AKA, or also known as condensation, and we call it again hydrolysis. Here I put the two types of reactions side by side. At the top we have dehydration synthesis. So synthesis we're building, you can build larger molecules from smaller subunits and water comes out of the reaction. If you've ever eaten yogurt, so let's say you open a pack of yogurt, you might see your yogurt and then at the top you see a thin layer of water. What's happening is when you make yogurt, you're taking sugar, these monomers, and the bacteria inside your starter culture to make yogurt will actually go through this reaction, condensation or dehydration synthesis, forming your larger yogurt uh, molecules, and then water, which is less dense, so it stays at the top of the yogurt container. Down here, again, we have that opposite reaction, hydrolysis, where you're adding water to lyse or to break a larger molecule into its subunits. And sometimes when you're tired, you might not need to reach for a cup of coffee yet. Maybe if you just take a glass of water and drink that, that might be your limiting factor. You don't have enough water to go through the hydrolysis reactions you need for energy at the moment. And I'm not going to show you here, but in your book, in chapter three, they give you a little link to this short animation to see hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis in a little bit more detail. So these reactions, dehydration synthesis, hydrolysis, these reactions are happening all of the time inside our body, inside our cells. But a lot of them are very slow, like it would take years for some of these reactions to happen. How do we get them to happen faster? To speed up these reactions, we use biological molecules called enzymes. So enzymes speed up reactions. Sometimes we call this speeding up process catalyze. That just means speed up. And they can speed up both types of reactions, hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis. When you are going through dehydration synthesis, you're forming new bonds and you need to put in energy, so an input of energy. Hydrolysis reactions, on the other hand, 
you're breaking bonds and that releases energy so energy comes out so this is a nice example of what happens when we eat bread so bread is a type of uh, starch it contains starches which is a bunch of glucose a bunch of glucose molecules linked together to form larger polymers if you took a piece of bread and you put it in your mouth and you take the same size same type of bread and you put it into a cup of water which one would break down into its subunits more quickly so the one in a cup of water would be much more slow it would break down more slowly because there are no enzymes in this glass of water. In contrast, if you took that bread and you put it in your mouth, we have saliva. And inside our saliva, we actually have an enzyme called salivary amylase that breaks down these larger polymers into their individual subunits. So if you took a piece of bread or even a plain cracker and put it in your mouth and don't even chew, you'll start tasting something sweet when your amylase breaks down those polymers into their smaller glucose subunits. Enzymes are very specific as to what they will break down. So an enzyme won't just break down any little thing. They're very, very specific. We have amylase in our saliva that breaks down carbohydrates. We also have sucrases that break down sucrose, lactases that break down lactose, maltase that breaks down maltose. So very often, but not always, the name of the enzyme ends with ASE and tells you what it's going to break down. Like sucrase breaks down sucrose. Again, lactose is broken down by lactase. We also have enzymes that break down lipids instead of carbohydrates. So a group of enzymes that does this is, are called lipases. And proteases break down proteins. Examples of proteases include pepsin or peptidase. And that concludes the first part of chapter three. In the next video, we're going to be looking at the first macromolecule type, carbohydrates, in more detail.